Audubon Society. My name is Stacy. I'm the executive director here and we are so excited that all of you are here with us tonight. Um, I want to send out a huge thank you also to the Bucks County Birders which has given us this lovely array of wonderful wonderful birding speakers. Um, just some really knowledgeable people that I think you're gonna have a really amazing time with. You can't hear. Did your mic on? This mic is not actually a mic. Oh. That was something else I was going to mention. We are also taping the program this evening um, with the Doylestown um, EAC so that it can be um, used later. But if you can't hear me at all, can any, uh, raise your hand if you can't hear me. There we go. I will pull out the actual microphone in just one minute and I will just talk really loud first. A um, couple of things just to sort of, um, again, thank you to, to everyone with Bucks County Birders. Um, we have a wonderful um, panel tonight. Um, two things I want to mention. This is just one of many, many programs that we do throughout the year. So please check out our website um, if you are looking for other things. There is a flyer that you can pick up on the way out if you didn't receive it already. We are doing a follow-up event that, um, that Bob is going to talk about a little bit later um, in, down in August, which should be really, really great. So just as we go, think about all the different things that you might want to come and do with us. We do twice a month bird walks here on our property, um, and we do lots of wonderful programming. So please come back for those things. Um, the second thing, and it's completely, oh, no, the second thing that I wanted to mention is you can also become a member of Bucks County Audubon Society. Um, there are brochures on the back table about membership. If you have any questions, definitely come and, um, and check in with me. I'd be more than happy to talk with you. Um, after the speakers today and the Q&A, um, please stick around and have more wine, have more food um, and enjoy ourselves. Alrighty? So thank you all very, very much. I'm going to turn it over to Leroy Tab, who is going to be our moderator tonight, and I'm going to get him the um, microphone. <laughs> Alrighty. There we go. Okay. Now I'll see if I can speak loud enough for people to hear. Those of you who can't are probably lucky. Uh, <laughs> All right, so this is our bird panel. We're going to be uh, talking, it's tied in with Year of the Bird, and we're going to be talking about topics about birds. But this is your uh, project. This is your presentation. You are to, going to ask questions uh, of, our, of our panel, and uh, so the program is going to be focused, contoured, customized to whatever you guys are interested in. We've given you a little sheet which has some uh, ideas, but you know, we really want you to ask questions that are relevant to what you are interested in. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction of our panel, and then I will turn it over to them. They will each do a little introduction themselves, and uh, at that point, and we'll have questions, okay? So, we'll start with Bob McGarry. He first dabbled in birding during middle school and when an inexplicable obsession with the extinct Labrador duck, well, we all know how that happens, sparked an interest in living birds. A decade later, after earning a BA in literature, he returned to Bucks County. That's when he realized he needed a hobby other than reading and reading and began birding seriously. These days, when not birding or reading, he writes and volunteers for Bucks County Audubon's advocacy and education committees. Diane Allison. <laughs> Diane needs no introduction tonight. <laughs> Has lived in Tinicum Township for 40 years. She served on the board of Bucks County Audubon, the Tinicum Conservancy, and Palisade School District. She's a graduate of Delaware Valley College and recently retired. Her interest in birds has taken her to many places, including all 50 states, Europe, Central, and South America, the Galapagos, and the Caribbean. Here at home, she's been the compiler for the Central Bucks Audubon Christmas Count, and for nearly 20 years, the compiler for all of Bucks County for the Pennsylvania Migration Count. Diane is on the Speaker's Bureau for the North American Bluebird Society, and has built over 2,000 bluebird boxes with school children and scouts. She enjoys hiking, nature photography, and introducing people to the wonders of nature. Next, we have Devich Flobotnik. <laughs> 
a lifelong Bucks County resident. He's been identifying birds since he could talk. <laughs> the love of birds and a keen sense of stewardship was instilled in him and fostered by his father. Bird conservation is not just a priority, but defines Devich's lifestyle. Since 2010, through his self-interested initiated, sorry, self-initiated nest box project, he has assisted successful nesting and fledging of over 1,100 American kestrels, mostly in Bucks County. Using his expert skills as a custom carpenter, Devich has built and installed each box and has continually monitored them each year from March through August. His keen eye for appropriate habitat and management of competing species has been effective in producing unmatched results anywhere in Pennsylvania. Devich also constructed and installed boxes for barn owls and with assistance from volunteers and, her uh, and the Heritage Conservancy has helped establish the first salamander crossing project in Upper Bucks County. The project ensures the safe crossing of the spotted salamanders as they use roadways to move to vernal ponds during their nocturnal spring migration. Devich has been a voting member of the Pennsylvania Ornithological Records Committee since 2012. They maintain a database and distribution statistics of all bird life in Pennsylvania. He also participates in multiple citizen science projects and has one of the largest life lists in Bucks County. <laughs> Armis Hill. Armis began birding. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows Armis. <laughs> Armis began birding in Bucks County about 50 years ago and has found many of his life birds here in this county. He has since gotten to know many birds in many places throughout the world. And have you ever been to Antarctica? Almost. Um, okay, so on all but one continent. <laughs> His life list is now close to 5,000 species, about half of all bird species worldwide, which is amazing. Wow. Armis has had many sightings in South America with over 1,000 species each in Brazil and Ecuador. And with over 35 trips to Japan, he has become an expert in that country's birds and wildlife as well. Through his nature con company, Focus on Nature Tours, Armis has led birding trips around the world and pelagic trips offshore from New Jersey to Delaware and North Carolina. Now prior to cell phones and the internet, birders had to share their information in more primitive ways. In 1979, there was a phone hotline called the Philadelphia Bird Line, and for 30 years, Armis was the voice on the phone that provided weekly updates. He also provided a similar service in Delaware and on a radio program in Wilmington. Armis now lives in Delaware, but he's often back here in Bucks County, where for him it all began. Okay, are you first? Am I first? Okay, so that one is for the taping, and this one is for the Okay. Oh, now they can hear. <laughs> Covered in microphones here. All right. Um, hopefully, I can stop that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see here. What's the best way to do this. <laughs> All right, um, so as you just heard, my name is Bob McGarry. Um, I've only been birding seriously for about four years now, meaning I um, have uh, by far the least experience out of all of the panel members here. And it's, it's quite an honor to, to be participating in this. Um, but um, if any of you happen to be beginning birders, my memory of being a beginning birder is still very fresh. So perhaps I'll be able to answer your questions about that later on. Um, for the moment, though, well, um, next one, there. Um, for the moment, though, I'm going to be talking a little bit about one of the reasons why we're having this event tonight. Um, as you know, uh, we're here to celebrate the Year of the Bird. And the reason that the National Audubon Society, National Geographic, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and more than 50 other organizations have teamed up this year, in particular to celebrate the Year of the Bird, is that this is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, so 
as you can imagine, this is a pretty important and special bill if so many organizations are coming together to honor it. Um, I'll be talking about the Carolina Parakeet in just a second. Um, anyway, um, a century ago, when the bill was passed, it was becoming increasingly obvious that overhunting was having an incredible toll on this nation's bird life. Uh, the Carolina Parakeet, and next slide. The passenger pigeon had both gone extinct earlier in the decade. Coincidentally, the last known individual of each species dying in the exact same aviary at the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, and the recently founded National Audubon Society was pushing to protect species like the next slide, snowy egret, which was being hunted in mass uh, to decorate, next slide, yeah. women's hats. Um, the fledgling Audubon Society was able to uh, manage to get the use of plumes in fashion banned in a handful of states, but that didn't stop people from hunting the birds, that only stopped people from wearing them in hats. Um, and it would be the Migratory Bird Treaty Act which ultimately put an end to that hunting. Uh, when it was passed in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was following up on a treaty signed two years earlier with Great Britain on behalf of Canada, which actually wasn't self-governing yet, uh, to eliminate the hunting of certain migratory bird species and to establish hunting seasons for, you know, other ones. Um, and that's exactly what the law did. In 1918, next slide. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act provided that it was unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, possess, sell, purchase, barter, import, export, or transport any migratory bird or their egg. Um, and at first, the migratory bird part was limited to insectivorous birds, uh, insect-eating migrants, uh, which excluded hawks and other raptors, even though some of them do eat insects. Um, hawks and eagles would gain protection later. Um, but the law did also apply to a wide variety of game birds, including waterfowl and doves, but also birds that we wouldn't think of hunting in the 21st century, like shorebirds and cranes. And the law was a success. Specifically, it's credited with helping the, next slide, sandhill crane, and next slide, wood duck, and the snowy egret again, uh, escape extinction. All of those birds were being pushed to extinction by hunting, and this law managed to help the, bring them back from the brink. Um, specifically, the law also led to the establishment of the National Wildlife Refuge System, which of course created havens for some of these birds and allowed their populations to recover. Over the years, the original treaty signed with Canada has been expanded by similar treaties signed with Mexico, Japan, and the former Soviet Union. And the list of birds that are protected under the law has been expanded in the 1940s to include eagles, and then again in 1972 to include basically all native species of birds. The list of birds that's protected by this law now exceeds 1,000. Um, around the same time, in the early 70s, there was a shift in the way that the Migratory Bird Act was interpreted. As I've more or less said, the law was originally reacting to overhunting, which was the largest problem birds faced at the time. However, the problems that birds face have changed over the years, and by the early 70s, following Silent Spring and the outcry over DDT use, it was becoming increasingly clear that other human activities were having a larger toll on birds than overhunting, specifically the actions of corporations and industry and the habitat degradation that they can cause. As a result, the law has been interpreted since the 70s to apply to what's called incidental take, which is a legal term for birds accidentally harmed as a result of industry or infrastructure. You'll recall that in the original terms of the MBTA, taking was one of the long list of activities that was now banned in you know, regards to migratory birds. And incidental take is a expansion on that. Incidental take could refer to birds which, um, such as waterfowl, which try to land on an oil waste pit, or raptors struck by wind turbines, or as is the case in the next slide, birds slathered in petroleum by oil spills, as was the case during the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, 
in that instance, BP uh, was investigated and then prosecuted under the terms of the MBTA. And they were fined $100 million for the damage to bird life. And that money was then used in turn to restore damaged wetlands and to help clean up the oil spill. It's a good system that holds polluters responsible for their actions. Now, this interpretation of the MBTA isn't applied carelessly and is not used to prosecute any and all private citizens who accidentally kill or injure a bird. Uh, for example, there was an occasion in 2014 when a contractor for the Postal Service was trimming a tree outside of a post office in California, and he accidentally trimmed a branch that was supporting a, next slide, black crown night heron nest. Um, you can kind of get, I mean, the bird's a little small in there, but you can get an idea of how a heron could hide in a tree and how somebody trimming one might not notice it. Um, after the nest fell out of the tree, um, five nestlings were killed or injured. Um, the contractor was investigated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but he was not charged. Uh, the incidental take interpretation is only used to prosecute in egregious cases, repeat violations, or when an investigation shows that the responsible parties have failed to implement best practices to protect birds. The term best practices, in essence, refers to common sense solutions to protect wildlife. These could be as simple as spreading a net over a waste oil pit to prevent migrating waterfowl from trying to land in it. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act is the best tool that we have to ensure that corporations are doing their best to implement these practices and to protect wildlife and, by extension, the larger ecosystem. Despite all of those benefits and the wonderful things that this bill has accomplished, there are currently two threats posed to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, the first that I'll discuss is a new interpretation of the law that was published last December by Daniel Giorgiani, who is the current Principal Deputy Solicitor to the Department of the Interior under Secretary Ryan Zinke. And this interpretation flatly denies that the law applies in instances of incidental take, instead claiming that the law only applies when birds are intentionally harmed. This sparked public outrage. It's one of the reasons why we're here tonight bringing attention to this bill. Uh, and it also inspired the National Audubon Society to file suit against the current administration. Um, although that's still in process, no results to talk about there. And it additionally inspired 17 former high-ranking Interior Department officials re representing every administration, both Democratic and Republican, back to Richard Nixon to write a letter to Secretary Zinke reminding him that there are decades of legal precedent for applying this law in instances of incidental take and condemning the new interpretation. However, even if certain individuals in the current administration aren't interested in legal precedent, the courts, we can hope, for the time being anyway, still are. <laughs> Earlier this year, a rancher in South Dakota filed suit against her county, which wanted to use a certain poison on her property to control the prairie dog population. Uh, but the rancher argued, under the terms of the MBTA, that the poison could accidentally hurt burrowing owls. Next slide. Like that one. Uh, which roost in holes dug by prairie dogs. Uh, and the judge agreed with her, despite the new interpretation. Now, this case isn't a perfect example for one thing. Uh, there's a follow-up hearing scheduled for this September. And if the rancher's alternative means of controlling the prairie dog population, which is shooting them, isn't found to be effective, then the, you know, the decision could be overturned. Um, but it is a victory for now anyway, however slight. Uh, the other threat comes from the Secure American Energy Act, which was introduced to the House last year by Representative Scalise of Louisiana. The Secure Act's main purpose is to promote oil, gas, and wind development on the Gulf Coast, not that we should be doing two of those things in an age of climate change anyway. But it also carries a rider, next slide, added to the bill by Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming, which is meant as a clarification regarding liability under Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And her clarification claims that incidental take is not illegal in the case that it was the result of an otherwise lawful activity. In other words, once again, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act can only be used to prosecute in instances when the bird was intentionally harmed or as a result of 
illegal activity, which I guess could refer to building without a permit or using a banned pesticide. But ultimately, this essentially defangs the law. Um, companies responsible for environmental disasters would not be prosecuted for the damage that they've caused to bird life, and the fines collected from that prosecution in turn wouldn't be used to help undo the damage that they've done. Uh, regardless of your political affiliation, I think that we can agree that accidents happen and that they're unfortunate and that when it's reasonable, those responsible for the accidents should be held responsible. Now, this bill, the SECURE Act, hasn't made it to the House floor for a vote yet, but it has passed the House Natural Resources Committee, so it's on its way. Um, for us as concerned citizens who want to protect the MBTA, uh, the most important thing we can do is to prevent this law from passing specifically with this amendment. Uh, to that end, we should be raising awareness about this bill, and we should be letting our elected officials, beginning with our representatives, know how we feel about this act. Uh, but of course, there are other things that you can do to help birds. It's not all political action, and I think that we'll be hearing about some of those tonight. So without further ado, I will hand the stage over to the next panelist. I've been asked tonight to talk to you a little bit about uh, the ways in which we as citizens and citizen scientists can help to understand what's going on with bird populations and to kind of keep an eye on things. And I know that there are a number of you out here who have taken part in Christmas bird counts before, uh, possibly in the spring migration count. And so we're going to talk about those a little bit and about some of the things that we have learned uh, from those counts. Uh, the Christmas bird count usually takes place for about a two-week period from mid-December till the first week in January. You don't need to be an experienced birder to take part. If you enjoy going out in the nice cold weather uh, for a few hours or for an entire day, you can come out and join a team. And the team will have a leader. So your eyes are helpful and you certainly don't need to be able to identify everything. Uh, they will help in the identification if you just say, there, what's that? And so so it's something that everyone can take part in and enjoy. We count every individual of every species. So we're counting every bird that we see during a 24-hour period. Um, there is a specific area that you would work in, and there is a count circle, and that's divided up into many different areas. Then at the end, uh, all the data is submitted to me as the compiler, and then I compile that data. I then transfer that over to National Audubon, and there is a site if you ever want to look up the data. Uh, you can go into the National Audubon Christmas Bird Count site, and you can see the data historically all the way back. Uh, the count that I compile for is the Central Bucks Christmas Bird Count, and it has been going on since 1966. So we have quite a collection of data. The Pennsylvania Migration Count, short PAMAC, uh, takes place in May, the second Saturday of May. And we again go out during a 24-hour period, count every single bird we see of every species. Now your number is going to be a little bit higher because this includes all the migrants that are arriving as well. And it's a, a very interesting day for the most part. And the weather's a little nicer if you don't like the cold. Uh, we've been doing that since about 1993. And it pr has provided some very good information, too. Now, you can go for an hour or you can go for the whole day. It's up to you uh, to settle with the leader of your particular area. And so everyone is welcome to take part in that. What do we do with the data afterward? Well, again, that data goes to a central repository with the PSO, or Pennsylvania Society of Ornithology. And they maintain that data. But we also maintain our data here in Bucks County because we are one of the few counties that have participated in the PAMAC every year since the very beginning. Many other parts of Pennsylvania dropped out for a while, but Bucks County has data straight through all the way. <laughs> yeah. And then you might ask, OK, what does this all mean? Well, that data is used by a variety of different people. In fact, I just read uh, an article today about it being used by a researcher with piping plovers who's been researching them since the 1980s. And he, when he began, he used Christmas bird count uh, data in order to get some information. So it's used by a wide range of researchers. Uh, it's also been used, I have had to provide it a number of times, uh, in cases of 
development that's going to occur, uh, when there are environmental assessments necessary to be done. And so they'll ask for bird data about a specific area. And I can provide that because I can look at the area they're talking about. I can pull out the areas from the Christmas bird count or from the PAMAC uh, through the years and give them that historical data. So it's often used for that. Yes? Uh, what about the breeding bird owls? That as well? The breeding bird atlas is not done every year. That's that's a well, uh, once every five years, if that. But yeah, that it, we're not due for one of those again right away. We just completed one of those not too long ago. So that that's a huge project. <laughs> that's a huge project. You have to tell me what that is. I will do that. Okay, what have we learned? Uh, from some of the information that we have gotten. And I'm just going to, Armis is going to do some trending things uh, with you uh, for the area, but I just want to go over a few of the birds that we uh, have had many changes with. So go ahead with the first one there. Oh, the pheasant. Uh, PAMAC had double digits, the spring count had double digit uh, pheasant numbers in 93, 94, and 95. Then we began missing them, and now and again we might have one that is a released bird, most likely, that has escaped the hunters uh, from that particular season. So that has been a complete change. Uh, we look at the uh, CBC from 1970, so the PAMAC is a little bit newer, but the CBC we have data back to, back to 1966, as I said. If you look at 1970, we had 281 pheasant in that particular count. And then the bottom dropped out, and we have had, as I said, one or two or none for the last number of years. So there's a change. Okay, next slide. Red-bellied woodpecker is an interesting one because uh, this is a bird that was more of a southern species and has expanded its uh, range northward over the years. So if we go back to the Christmas count of 1966, we had three. And now in, in 2015, now we keep track of high counts uh, through the historical record of the, of the counts, and the high count occurred in 2015, 204. So so big changes for this bird. Okay, next. The bald eagle. Here's one that's been a pretty obvious change. In the PAMAC, we had none until 1997, then one here and one there. Every year, we've had them since 2000. And the high count was 2017 with 17 of them. So that has progressively gone each year. We, we get, basically get a new high count for uh, the bald eagle. The CBC, ironically enough, we did have one in 1966, which kind of surprised me when I looked back. One in 1975, then one in 1994, then two in 2000, and then every year since until we hit this record now of 17. Okay. The Eastern Bluebird. The CBC had none from 1966 to 1969, five in 1970, then sporadically rising through until a high count of 352 in 1999. So we've had a tremendous change in those in Bucks County. A lot of that can be attributed to Devich's dad, who built bluebird boxes all over the place uh, when they were first trying to make their comeback. Okay. The rough grouse, our Pennsylvania state bird. Well, here's one that we just don't see anymore. 93, 94, 95, we had uh, like one on the Pamax. None since then. On the CBC, none since 1997, uh, but the numbers actually really dropped, the bottom dropped out of them in the 1980s. So there's a sort of a sad story, okay? The great blue heron. The PAMAC in 93, we had nine. In 94, nine, nine. In 95, seven. And then 51 in 1997, and a high count in 2008 of 130. So this is a real comeback story here. Um, Bob was talking about the Migratory Bird Treaty and the use of the bird feathers in hats. Uh, this is one of the birds that took a real hit from that situation and has really made a nice comeback. Okay, do we have any more? That's it, okay. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I can. <laughs> can you hear me better? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Good evening, glad to be here. I'm going to start off with a question or two. What we're going to look at for a little bit is Bucks County. And over the years, 
where we are now. First question. Not that there's been that many years, but now I have to wear eyeglasses. <laughs> Sorry about that. First question, does anybody, it's kind of like the price is right. Uh, does anybody here have any idea how many people in the last U.S. Census live in Bucks County? Anybody want to give a guess? You're on. Uh, 60,000. In Bucks County. 650. Wait, 550. 550,000. Right. Anybody? 670,000, you get the refrigerator right here. Come on down. No, you don't have to come on down. Anyway, seriously, 625,000 in the last census. Now think back, those of you who can, 1950. This was before Fairless Hills and Levittown. How many people lived in Bucks County in 1950 census? Some of you were around then, I know it. Okay, I'll tell you, 145,000 in 1950. And then in 1960, it went up to 309,000. But again, that's when Levittown and uh, Fairless Hills were being built in the steel mills down there. Birds. How many species of birds have been found in Bucks County? Give or take a few, but I mean, approximately. Any guesses? The number of bird species. How much? Very, very good, but a little high. 330 species of birds in Bucks County. Now, I have a couple props here. This little book, I hate these, all this gadgetry, but anyway. This little book here that you saw when you came in, was written by a gentleman who recently, unfortunately, just passed away, Ken Kitson. It was written in 1998, so it's a little bit dated, but again, we all are. <laughs> and um, it was a follow-up to a book that was written in the 1950s originally, updated in 1965 by Les Thomas. And uh, basically, it was a follow-up, and another follow-up is needed, but uh, it's a very good little book, and you just realized that it was written 20 years ago, um, but still, it's a, it's a very nice book. Um, Les Thomas, oh, he was active at Churchville Nature Center, and when he got older, he moved up to New York. I birded with him up there one time at Saranac Lake, New York, and saw Solwet Owl, and I think my first whippoorwill. I knew him through my mentor, who I'll mention, Alan Brady, those of you who remember him. If you walk out this door and make a left this evening when you leave, there's a little bench right over there, right behind the first tree that's in his honor, uh, in memory of him. So he was um, the big catalyst for my Bucks County birding. Anyway, in this book, Birds of Bucks County, what I'd like to do for just a quick second, can we have the first picture, please? There was a birder, well, he was author, too. He was a number of things, who lived in New Jersey, a naturalist writer. He's gone now also, but uh, Leonard LaRue. I don't know if you ever heard of Leonard LaRue. And he told me a long time ago, and he wrote this down, and I guess if it's written, it's true, um, <laughs> that the most common bird in eastern North America when the settlers came from Europe was the red-eyed vireo, because there was so much forest. It's a bird of the forest. Now, in Ken Kitson's little book, there's one paragraph I want to share with you that gives you an idea of what Bucks County was like back in the day when they called it, well, the name Pennsylvania, you know, means Penn's Woods. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't Penn's Woods, somebody else's woods, but yeah, that's another story. In the 17th century, when the first settlers arrived, Bucks County was almost entirely covered with a climax forest. Oaks and hickories were the prevailing trees, but there were some areas with conifer forests of white pine or hemlock, especially along the north-facing slopes of tributary stream valleys flowing to the Delaware River. 
Along the river and its main tributaries, there were predominantly river birch and swamp maple trees, while the sweet gum and willow oak were limited to and predominant in the coastal plain. So that you understand, the coastal plain in Bucks County was only, or is only, about eight miles from the Delaware River, let's say in Bristol, eight miles north. In other words, to where the fall line would be, uh, which is just above Trenton and Yardley. Anyway, um, reference was made to the giant forest trees. And this is incredible because I grew up in Bristol Township, such as one ash tree in Bristol Township that measured 20 feet in circumference and yielded 10 cords of wood. So that gives a little idea of what things were back in those early, early days. Now, the next picture, please. In my early days of birding in Bucks County, what I used to do, I don't have enough hands, but I do have enough pockets. There we go. Hey, how about that? Anyway, what I used to do when I first started to bird was go to Churchville, uh, reservoir and in the pine trees there. I took that picture back in 1974 or something like that. Long-eared owls. Next, please. I remember shortly after I met Alan, he said, go up to where Core Creek Park is now and there'll be a big sycamore tree and if you're there after dark, the barn owl will come out. So that was another bird that used to be in um, Bucks County, much more than it is now, if it's even here at all, I'm not sure about that. But at any rate, uh, I took that picture uh, in a barn in Delaware when I first moved there. Next picture. <laughs> this is a bird in Bucks County that doesn't occur very often. It was on the property of Devich's father, Steve, and Alan and I went there, you tell me, 1970-something, 75, 76, and um, there's only one thing that's more adorable than a little saw wet owl, and that would be, next, three saw wet owls. <laughs> well, I've been told that they were back there again in 1989, but uh, it's not something that you normally have in Pennsylvania, although I understand there was one. Yes. Uh, yeah. What year was that? Uh -huh. It was sometime in the early 80s. In the early 80s. So they're birds that are normally north of here. Next, please. The bald eagle. Now, Diane mentioned that, but I have some other things on my notes that I can say about the bald eagle. And that is, if I can find this. In 1980, this, oh, first of all, I'll preface that by saying that the problem for the bald eagle and the next bird, the osprey, was DDT and other pesticides, let's say, in 1950s and 60s, bad. In 1980, in all of Pennsylvania, oh, that reminds me, before I did, I forgot to say something about Bucks County, and that is interesting. You may not know this, but we talked about 625,000 people living in Bucks County. It is the fourth most populous county in all of Pennsylvania. I don't know how many of you know that. But what you may not know is in the entire United States, it's in the top 100. It's the 98th most populous country in the United States. And there's a lot of counties in the United States. Now, the fact that, the fact that um, there's more people doesn't necessarily mean there's less birds. It's the habitat's different, of course. But uh, I mentioned Bucks County having 330 species overall. But I don't think I said that in 1876, and I don't know who took the count. I'm sorry, I don't know that. There was a centennial going on. There were 206 birds that year in Bucks County. We'll move ahead, 1937, 201 birds, different species. 1954, 239 species. Going further up, 1984, we went up to 251. 1996, 252. Does anybody have an idea what made the bird number of species go up in bucks 
even though the habitat was altered so much. What did not exist back then in the early days? Not climate change, that's a factor with some things. The fact that there are now lakes. Lake Nakamixon, Lake Galena. There were no lakes in Bucks County, so all the water birds would just be along the river. So the increase in birds was just the creation of new water habitat. And that gets me back to the bald eagle. The bald eagle, in all of Pennsylvania, in 1990, there were eight nesting pairs in the entire state. 1990, eight nesting pairs, that's all. 10 years later, in 2000, we're up to 48 nesting pairs. 2006, up to 100. 2008, 150. 2011, 200. And 2013, 270 nesting pairs of bald eagles in Pennsylvania, up from eight in 1990. Now, if you pull up on the, on the internet, I think Pennsylvania Game Commission, you can see a map of Pennsylvania and they have locations where all, they all, all the eagle nests are in the state. Bucks County has a nice number of those little blue circles. Okay, moving on to another bird that had a DDT situation, the osprey. The osprey, in a 2016, I'm doing this differently, I'm, I'm starting more recently. 2016 survey, there were in Pennsylvania 148 osprey nests. And they were basically in six clusters, like in certain areas along rivers and so on. In the first Pennsylvania breeding atlas, which was done between 1984 and 1989, there were only nine breeding pairs of osprey in Pennsylvania. In 1979, a few years before that, it had been extirpated as a breeding bird in Pennsylvania, gone. So that's another good story. Next, please. And there's the os nesting osprey. Next. Well, what can I tell you? <laughs> I can tell you, this is another bird that's learned to adapt to us, I guess. I have a second prop. This book, which you cannot see the cover, so I could tell you it's anything, but I'll tell you what it really is. <laughs> it's the birds of eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, by an ornithologist who was a curator back at the Academy of Natural Sciences way back when, written in 1903, Whitmer Stone. Very respected ornithologist, and I'll refer to a few things that he has in his book as we go along, but one of them is that back then, the Canada goose was not known to nest south of the 42nd degree latitude, which is basically Massachusetts. In other words, they weren't here all year in those days. Okay, the next, they're here now though. <laughs> this one may surprise you. In this book written by the respected ornithologist, who was really at the top of his game in that day, the mockingbird, I'm not saying anything because we learned a lot from people before, so please don't misunderstand me. But the mockingbird was in the book as a wren. They thought it was in the wren family or something. I don't know why it was there under wren's mockingbird. But at any rate, it was in the early days of the 20th century, according to the book, very rare, summer resident, probably still occurring irregularly in southern New Jersey and perhaps in, Pennsylvania, in southern Pennsylvania. So there's a bird that was a southern bird that was not really known in those days in these parts. The red-bellied woodpecker, I don't have a picture, but I don't have it because Diane showed the picture already. Anyway, that was a rare and irregular straggler. He called it a straggler, mostly in the winter. Um, all of the records in this book were from Chester and Delaware County. None of them were from Bucks County. Uh, there were no, for red-bellied woodpecker back in those days, there were no breeding records whatsoever in eastern Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Now that bird came north, I guess as the climate got a little warmer and the habitat was altered, and uh, there we go. Now another one that's not pictured here, but you all know what it is, the cardinal. The cardinal back in the old days was confined to river valleys, especially the lower Susquehanna, I'm talking Pennsylvania now, 
and it was not found beyond the first ridge in Pennsylvania. And that's a northern bird, a southern bird, I mean, that's gone north and it's in Canada now and New England. Mockingbirds even up in New England. Okay, next please. Cattle egret. Cattle egret is a bird you don't see in Bucks County very often, but it has occurred here. But it has an interesting story which I'll mention. Birds do fly, and they can fly surprisingly far. They say, whoever they is, they say that it came on its own from Africa to South America, where the Atlantic Ocean is not as wide. It's still pretty wide as other places. But anyway, that's what they say. And they say that happened in the 1870s. It was in the 1930s that it started to increase throughout South America, came north into North America. First one was nesting in Florida in 1952, Cape May, New Jersey, around the same time. And then the cattle egret actually became more common throughout the Americas than any other egret that we have here. Now, since, oh, a few years ago, it's gone down. There was a big uh, heronry on the Susquehanna River that had 5,000 pairs of cattle egrets. It's completely gone. There's still a heronry on Pea Patch Island in the Delaware River south of Wilmington. And if you see cattle egrets, generally you see them in that area of Delaware. But at any rate, uh, they, they have uh, seriously declined. I guess they peaked and then declined. But I will say one thing. Um, y you wonder about birds flying so far. I was on a, with a tour in Iceland, oh, up in northern Iceland, driving along the coast, and I met an Icelandic birder, and he said, we have a good bird up here. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, just go up the road a little bit. There'll be a cattle egret. I thought, a cattle egret up here? My goodness, we're at the Arctic Circle. Well, he was right, there was a cattle egret. They're normally in Europe, only in Spain, you know. Spain and Portugal, they not leave Portugal out. But anyway, um, I got home and I read in one of my other books that, one of my books, I should say, that there was a record of a cattle egret that flew all the way down to Antarctica, to an island on the edge of Antarctica. So birds do fly well, and they're found as up as high as 14,000 feet in the Andes and Ecuador once in a while, so they do get there. The next bird is an interesting one in bucks, and I read something just two days ago that I'm gonna share with you. The Pennsylvania Game Commission has a project going on right now where lesser black-backed gulls, which are here in the wintertime, they're tracking them with satellite telemetry. And the story is, this is what they said. They said Pennsylvania is the center of lesser, well, they, they go that south to Florida and beyond now, but for quite a while, Pennsylvania had a large population. But it wasn't Pennsylvania, I hate to tell you, that was the center. It was Bucks County that was the center of the uh, lesser black backed gulls. And they said they didn't know where they nest. One was found in Maine one summer, but it was mated with a herring gull, and that wasn't what they were looking for. But now they have gotten some results on this satellite tracking, and the cattle egret has, uh, not cattle egret, move ahead. The lesser black backed gull has been found nesting, the ones that have the telemetry uh, devices, in eastern Canada and Greenland. So basically, uh, what did they say? Five of them in Greenland and three way up there in eastern Canada. Now, another story I'll mention about Iceland real fast. They did not nest. There's a lot of gulls in Iceland. A lot of gulls. Except the Iceland gull, I'll tell you by the way. The Iceland gull is not in Iceland in the summer. It's only there in the winter. But uh, having said that, it comes from Greenland. They got things a little mixed up. But anyway, um, what I've found with Iceland gulls, uh, with um, lesser blackbacks in Iceland, is that, well, I should say something. Iceland has a lot of different habitat. There's areas where cattle, the Icelandic horses are. There's areas that are um, a few little trees, not too many, but not just one habitat. And there is a type of habitat in Iceland where there's nothing because it looks lunar. It's like lava, there's rocks, you know. 
And that's where the lesser blackback gulls are making their nests, on this area where the other birds never were there before. The first nesting of the lesser blackback gull in Iceland was in 1920. And now if you go there in the summer, it's one of the most common nesters there. And, then and since 1990, numbers of them have been nesting in Greenland. So it seems as if Greenland is a place where, uh, let's see, first bred in Greenland in 1990, now it's very common there. And we get them here. Now we have one more bird, and that is another one that Diane mentioned. And it's the bluebird. And this morning I talked to Ray Hendrick, who used to live in Bucks, now lives in Delaware. And my question to him was, Ray, how many bluebird boxes did you build? He built a lot of bluebird boxes. And um, he started to tell me that he started to do it in the 1960s because there was a Christmas count where there were none. And then there was a Christmas count with two, two Eastern bluebirds. So he made Oh, I guess he said something like 300, he did 300 bluebird boxes. And on average, well, I won't say on average, in 2016, I guess up to in the later years, the average was 100 to 120 fledglings, fledglings, which was very good. And they had fledglings every year. And on that positive note, thank you, I'm done.